Thanks very much for joining us today. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us and then we're gonna get started. My name is Sarah Yedicito and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Our session will be approximately 60 minutes in total with a 40 to 45 minute presentation. And then we're gonna leave about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for a question and answer period. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to leave your questions in the chat throughout the session and we'll do our best to go through them at the end. So without further delay, let's pass things over to Chris Ballard, our CEO of Passive House Canada. Well, thank you, Sarah, and, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, this next in the series of our cold climate uh, presentations. Great to see so many people and so much uh, uh, interest out there about uh, uh, passive house building in cold climates and, and we'll hopefully uh, be able to answer a lot of good questions today. I want to start uh, with a land acknowledgement however uh, and by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Uh, while today we meet on a virtual platform I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility uh, to improve relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Uh, from coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of uh, all the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. So thank you all again for being here. Uh, and let's move along. So uh, first slide, let's move along and talk a little bit about uh, Passive House Canada. Uh, today's presentation, uh, will uh, uh, we're doing this together with Parks Canada. We're going to get an update on the Lake Superior National Marine Conservation Area uh, by uh, Garth uh, Grunerud. Uh, then we're going to talk about the, uh, we have a presentation on Fort St. John, a presentation case study on an absolutely beautiful building there. Uh, and we'll uh, allow you to uh, ask some questions at the end. So next slide. First, uh, and this is the only, uh, only slide, Passive House Canada. Uh, we are a membership-based social enterprise. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy work with government, with industry, uh, uh, with, uh, with the public. We provide education and professional development. We provide technical services to our members and to, uh, to others. Uh, we have members and staff and instructors located all across Canada. Uh, some of the pictures you see on this slide are recent graduates from our uh, Passive House Designer Consultant uh, uh, course and our, uh, our trades course. Next slide. So our mission is to make zero emission buildings known and adopted by government, industry and the public. Uh, we support government and industry in the transition to high performance buildings through education, certification and policy development. And um, uh, while we support all uh, standards that are uh, getting us to a higher quality building, a, a more efficient building, uh, at Passive House Canada, we promote the uh, Passive House Institute building standard. Um, frankly, it, it's the one that we see as globally recognized as uh, one of the fastest ways uh, and the clearest pathways to get us to the high performance buildings that we need. Next slide. So without further ado, uh, welcome Garth from Parks Canada. Garth is the asset manager uh, Northern, uh, for Northern Ontario Field Unit of Parks Canada. Um, and I'll turn the uh, presentation over to you, Garth, to give us an update. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, Sarah, we can go to the next slide. So the Northern Ontario Field Unit is based in Northern Ontario. We've got um, a Lake Superior National Marine Conservation Area. We also have a national park and two national historic sites, plus other uh, monuments and things scattered throughout Northern Ontario, but predominantly what I'm here to talk about today is our initiative and Parks Canada's initiative on building to a different standard. Rather than just building a building that we put occupants in, we're looking at having a new administrative and discovery center based in Nipigon, Ontario, which is an hour and a 10 minute drive uh, east of Thunder Bay. And to build a building that serves 
all of our functions and will service our needs for many years in the future. So next slide, please, Sarah. So we've got a building and, and I've provided two other updates now, but we've got a building that's gonna serve for five functions plus public needs that are gonna come into this space. We also have a discovery center in there plus office space plus all of those functions. So one of the big concerns with our passive house design so far was actually building orientation what 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 windows and walls to have facing south east and west and we finally did settle on a orientation that has staff facing predominantly south so that we're not overheating public areas of the building and we will have a rather large overhang on the south east and west facing walls we're gonna have approximately 30 staff in there and it'll, it'll fluctuate seasonally, but maximum staff is about 30 and capacity inside the building for approximately 60 visitors to enjoy the Discovery Center, which will be more of a museum gallery space. So that has also provided issues from a passive house design standard or design process. And unlike a home or single occupancy building or, or um, uh, block of housing, I and pa Parks Canada inside this building have five functional departments. So five tenants that all need to use the same, same space for different things, be it laboratory, discovery center, visitor interp, or general office needs. So balancing that and all of the needs of the building along with the passive house criteria have been uh, not an issue, but a design concern. So uh, next slide, please. So we've maximized our southern exposure. We've got a five sided building, which um, hasn't made the building much larger than a four sided building. Once we've worked with uh, the massing through the consultant. And so far, it's uh, looking very good. And, and all of our five functions that are going to be using this building will be or are happy so far we'll see once they get into the building um, we're trying to limit summer sun penetration so having large overhangs so in the sun, summer we won't have much going in through the windows but in the winter we'll have a lot of that sun penetrating further into the building we've also on the um, former parking lot that we're building on looked at re introducing vegetation so with non-invasive species and vegetation also for a learning aspect so we're not just looking at having a site here in a building that provides information and learning activities for external for um, what plant species are available we're also looking at it from a research and conservation area from the building as well so rather than just having a four walls, a floor and a ceiling, and just saying we occupy this space. We're also looking at our new building, um, which would be tendered hopefully later this calendar year, have that be a part of research and conservation as well. So when somebody comes into our space, they will not only be able to ask about the land and species that are, are on from a vegetation standpoint, but also from the building standpoint, how much energy are we using? and what have we done with the building how did we get here so that's my update on the building hopefully to have more at our next cold climate series back to you chris well thanks garth and uh, as always this is a, a really exciting uh building really a, a great opportunity to be able to talk to uh, folks about uh, high performance uh, net zero buildings passive house buildings so we look forward to continuing to work with you um our our guests today uh, I'm really excited by this. Uh, they're responsible for the Fort St. John, uh, BC 50 unit passive house. It is a highly energy efficient, affordable rental housing building uh, located uh, in Fort St. John's, uh, British Columbia. That's a Northern town. Uh, it's a very unique project in partnership with BC Housing, uh, BC's uh, Housing Management Commission and BC Hydro. Uh, and it was designated as the first passive house building of its kind in Canada at the time of the construction. And I know when I introduce you to the team, uh, they're going to have some beautiful pictures uh, of this uh, particular uh, building. Um, 
and the folks who are responsible. We have some of the key players here. Uh, their bios are, uh, are, uh, are extensive. Their backgrounds are, uh, are extensive. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of some of our speakers today. We have uh, Paul Hammond, who is the architect of Low Hammond Row Architects. Paul's the principal architect uh, at the firm with uh, 29 years experience collaborating with multidisciplinary teams for post-secondary institutions, public library boards, nonprofit housing agencies. Uh, he began his career in Toronto, uh, involved with the design and construction of academic buildings, libraries in public schools. Uh, he moved to BC in 2005 with his family uh, to join the practice. So I won't get into uh, too much more detail. We'll give people a chance to talk about their expertise. Uh, we have Stuart Fix, who's the principal from Renew Engineering. Stuart's uh, a professional mechanical engineer with a master's degree in building science and holds certification as a passive house designer in both Germany and North America. Uh, he's got a background in machine design and project management and has been active in high performance buildings design since 2008. Uh, next uh, in the speaking tour, we have Doug Mackey, who's the senior project manager for WCPG. Uh, Doug recently joined that organization after being involved in the residential construction uh, business for more than 30 years. He's managed projects ranging from luxury one suite per floor high rises, uh, uh, large four story wood frame condo buildings uh, over parkades, townhouses, single family homes. And he's built many social housing projects in BC and spent years directing uh, on job sites. So, uh, Welcome to uh, to everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to turn the presentation over to this team, uh, and you can take it away. And when we're done, we'll uh, we'll have a time for questions and uh, and answers, and hopefully some really good discussions. So thanks again, folks, for being here, and uh, over to you. Beautiful. Oh, there you go. Uh, thanks, Chris, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're happy to be here to present this uh, Passive House project. I'll just go to the next slide, please. Um, Chris, I also just want to clarify, it's the this project was the largest of its kind in Canada at the time. I, I'm not sure it was the first of its kind. Um, anyway, we're going to um, discuss some of the project parameters and the general characteristics of the project and then get into analyzing the criteria and factors that influence some of our design decisions, followed by lessons learned uh, with the team. Next slide. Uh, I'm also pleased to be joined with my colleagues, Doug Mackey, uh, Senior Project Manager with WCPG, and Stuart Fix, Principal of Renew. Uh, Stuart was instrumental in developing the energy strategy for the overall building, and they'll be sharing their perspectives as well. Next slide. Uh, as you can imagine, a project of this size has a considerable consultant team required. I just wanted to highlight a few consultants that really brought extensive experience in passive house design, uh, starting with uh, Alex Maurer, 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 excuse me, uh, from Markin Design. He, he oversaw the development of the PHPP modeling and the PH certification process. As well, we had Aquacoast Engineering led by Pat Cuthbert, who was our building envelope consultant, and of course, Stuart Fix, who um, has extensive uh, experience with Passive House. Next slide, please. So just a high level, the project is a six-story wood frame, 50-unit residential building uh, designed in a cold climate zone in Fort St. John, which has an altitude of 690 meters. And we certified the to Passive House Classic in 2019. Next slide. Uh, as mentioned, it, uh, the project evolved out of a partnership between BC Hydro uh, and BC Housing. BC Hydro needed temporary workforce housing for their uh, workers in town for the short term. And over the long term, the building will be turned back to affordable rental housing for families um, under uh, BC Housing stewardship. And the city of Fort St. John, um, they actually put up the land for purchase to help facilitate the project. 
so in the RFP that came out as a design build uh, proposal in 2017, it was mandated uh, that the building had to be designed to pass code standards. Next. So we'll look at the design and describe some of the site conditions and building features, followed by looking at the passive house principles used to achieve certification. Next. Port St. John here is located in Eastern British Columbia in the Peace River Regional District. And this map shows the average of the annual extreme minimum temperatures between 1981 and 2010 as uh, minus 40 degrees. Next slide. Um, the graph shows projected temperature increases out to 2080 here uh, if greenhouse gases uh, emissions continue to, to rise. And uh, according to this trend, the mean temperature in Fort St. John is expected to rise in 2050 by 1.5 degrees and almost four degrees by 2080. So as we consider passive house design for multi-unit residential buildings with these temperature increases, cooling starts to become a factor. Next. So regarding the site, it's, uh, it's a great location close to downtown uh, near parks and trails, uh, as well as shopping and amenities. So if you compared it to a lead, lead score, uh, it would rank very high. Next slide. However, um, it was uh, late in the design process when we um, were able to get the results of the soil testing and it, uh, it proved that the site is predominantly clay and so we're anticipating, um, you know, conventional slab on grade and, and strip footing foundations, and then realized uh, that we're going to have to use considerable amount of helical piles, grade beams and suspended concrete slab. So the design team had to quickly uh, change the direction and, um, and had to fast track the foundation work in order to beat the, uh, the winter season. Next slide. So from a site planning um, uh, point of view, you know, Garth men mentioned it as well. It's very important to understand the, the solar orientation of the building and, um, you know, conventional wisdom would have the longest facade facing south. And, uh, but when you look at multifamily units, uh, unlike a, a commercial building um, or a single family home where, you know, you can move around the entire space and benefit from different orientations, um, we, we thought it was most appropriate uh, for this to allow natural sunlight into all the suites um, and uh, combine with that, analyzing all the requirements of the site, uh, the extensive amount of parking and uh, requirement for all on-site uh, rainwater retention, um, as well as green spaces, playground areas and things. All of those forces were competing uh, and the proportion of the site to determine, you know, which way to orient it. And uh, so we kept it with this design um, and it, it was uh, resulted in a two kilowatt hour penalty uh, in the passive house and PHPV model. Um, but we were still able to manage uh, through our rest of the design features. Next slide. So by keeping the building form simple and compact, uh, we were able to meet the passive house criteria with a comfortable margin. The, the layouts of these two and three bedroom units were specified in the RFP and um, they particularly uh, requested no balconies uh, off the units. And uh, so, you know, we had the, we created a slight vent form to organize around the central core, created, this allowed for uh, creation of more green space for the playgrounds on the west side and created privacy for the walkout units and rain gardens on the east side. Next. Regarding the facade, the, the simple form also allowed the building uh, facade to become a bit of a canvas uh, where we could express the uh, Passable's principles and qualities uh, of this high performance building, uh, such as expressing the thickness of the wall. Um, so this was the first of its kind uh, at this scale in Fort St. John. Um, and we wanted to, we wanted the design to be unique. So it really stood out as, uh, as passive house. And so, you know, each 
facade also responds to the different solar orientation. So we have various uh, sun shading devices uh, as needed. And then the panelized cladding with the uh, precision of the joints and color transitions tended to accentuate the deep recessed windows. Again, an, another major feature of, uh, of Paso Pals buildings. And then we also um, sloped the roof and drained, um, drained all the water off the building on, into rain gardens. So on the east side, we actually expressed in the facade those rainwater leaders, which again is another feature of uh, reducing penetrations in, in the building. Next slide. Regarding the construction, um, this is a picture of the completed wood frame. Um, the roof is constructed of a monoslope truss that's protected by 433 millimeters of EPS roof insulation and an SBS roof membrane, uh, which we ran underneath the mechanical penthouse to reduce the volume of the passive house envelope. So on the roof there, you can just see the outline of the curb just starting for the, for the, uh, for the mechanical unit. And, um, and so the insulation just ran right through. Next slide. Regarding the assemblies, you know, here's a close up of the cladding, uh, triple glazed vinyl windows we used and the vertical sunshades. Um, the walls were protected with 200 millimeters of mineral wool insulation and a hardy panel cementitious rain screen cladding. Next. Regarding community, um, it was an important design goal in the RFP to foster community in the building and the requirements for large and small uh, uh, common gathering spaces. And, uh, but only one outdoor deck per floor was permitted in the program. And so it was located adjacent to a common uh, lounge on every floor, which we located on the center of the building um, to capture afternoon and evening sun. Next. Uh, community and wellness, the ground oriented suites, as we, as we mentioned, uh, were nicely tucked into the east side um, with the chevron space uh, surrounded by landscapes and, uh, and the rain gardens. Next. As mentioned, the site had, uh, had to be designed to capture all stormwater on site without connection to city mains. So as a result, we, um, we used a uh, Rain gardens to implement the uh, capture of surface water from the parking area and use non native and native plants uh, were used to filter the water. And even the parking stalls, we were able to cut back the ends of the parking stalls, starting with the, uh, with the wheel stops to allow that extra space to be uh, become uh, green. Next. By designing the passive flow standards, the overall energy requirements generally uh, reduces by 90% uh, compared to conventional methods. Um, and uh, as energy codes continue to change, the new normal uh, is becoming high performance. Next, regarding life cycle, um, you know, considering the life of the building could be 60 years or, or more, it was important to select durable materials that can be easily replaced uh, throughout the life. Next. And then, you know, it's a reminder also to, it's important to share the unique features of the Passive House building uh, with the occupants so they understand the, the principles and, and uh, the energy conservation that goes along with, with this type of building. Next. So, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so, now we're going to look at the passive house design principles and the criteria that governs certification. So next slide. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with, these, uh, with these numbers, uh, if you've been to these sessions in the past, um, but just quickly go through it. As I mentioned, we did design to passive house classic. So these are the numbers. Uh, there are multiple levels of passive house that you could, uh, you could certify to. So in general, the space heating energy demand not to exceed 15 kilowatt hours per meter square per year. And the primary energy demand not to exceed 120 kilowatt hours, uh, including all electrical loads. Air tightness must not exceed 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 Pascal's pressure in both um, pressurized and depressurized states. And the thermal comfort must be met for all living spaces during winter and summer months, not to exceed 25 degrees Celsius 
for more than 10 hours uh, per year. Next. So th these next five slides outline the general five principles behind um, passive house design. And the first is thermal insulation. So the idea is you want to wrap your building around the top, all sides, and under the foundations um, with a significant uh, thermal envelope that uh, produces, in general, you know, a maximum U value of 0.15. Next. Uh, passive house windows, uh, high performance windows are required. They don't necessarily have to be certified passive house windows, but uh, definitely have a high quality. And in buildings in northern climates like this, you know, you'll often see triple glaze uh, requirements uh, to meet the numbers. And the U value, maximum U value uh, for windows, in, is a rule of thumb, is about 0.8. Next. Heat recovery is, uh, is required as well to provide uh, good indoor air quality and energy savings by capturing the heat that's exhausted from the exhausted air. And so you could have uh, HRV units, heat recovery ventilators, or energy recovery ventilators in your system. Next. And then air tightness. Um, of course, uh, you know, we need to minimize um, that to air leakage to 0.6. And, uh, and it's usually easiest to have a, um, a solid air barrier, continuous air barrier, starting with the exterior sheathing. It's the easiest to install, it seems, and you get uh, really great uh, performance. Next slide. And then, so the last principle is thermal bridging. And, um, you know, they can't, it can't be avoided, but uh, they can certainly be uh, minimized. And so it takes great uh, consideration with the team um, to dis you know, create the proper details, but then also to understand the thermal performance and sometimes some additional modeling is required to prove that out and then put those numbers into the passive uh, PHPP model. Next slide. So how do these pass flows principles apply to this building? Um, here's an exonometric of, of our scheme. Um, we fully wrapped the building envelope with uh, high amounts of insulation on all sides. We use triple glazed high performance windows with sun shading as appropriate. And uh, mechanically, we had two central ERVs on the roof providing ventilation and heat recovery. And we use six air source heat pumps also located on the, on the roof in yellow there um, that provided the heating and cooling uh, for the units. And our continuous air barrier was on the exterior sheathing. And Thermal bridging was uh, carefully detailed to reduce uh, thermal losses. Next. So here's a section of the, of the building and how the mechanical system works. Um, ERVs, the energy recovery ventilators were used on the roof. Um, they distribute the fresh air to each suite through the corridor and then return stale, stale air, air back to the heat recovery units. The VRV, the variable refrigerant volume air source heat pumps, they provide the heating and cooling uh, to each suite, moving energy around the building to meet the demands uh, on a suite by suite basis. So based on, on the given orientation, uh, you know, sides that are having the sun and the others that are in shade are gonna have different demands and this system can move that energy around efficiently. Okay, next slide. So here are the numbers that uh, if we compare to the passive host targets, uh, our heating demand was 11.4 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year uh, compared to the maximum of 15. So we had a pretty good margin uh, in that design. Next slide. Uh, the heating, uh, the space heating energy demand. Um, this, uh, this shows the graphs of uh, sort of the the uh, energy balance between the losses and the gains. And so at the bottom of the right hand side in the red, that's showing the amount of energy that had to, had to be put back in to compensate for, for heat losses. Next slide. This is an example comparable of the U values of our, of our building, uh, the exterior walls, the roof, ground floor, the windows, and they all fell within, uh, you know, below the ranges that, uh, you know, a sort of rule of thumb for passive house design, as well as the, um, 
the uh, uh, solar gain uh, maximum percentage. Next slide. So uh, not part of uh, necessarily the, the prime possible principles, but this is a bit of a rule of thumb uh, regarding massing of your building. Um, the surface to surface area to floor ratio of the building. Uh, we were able to achieve a 0.82 uh, ratio and rule of thumb is maximum two, uh, 2 2.0. And so you can see in red, uh, we kept our, we reduced the uh, Passable's envelope by keeping the mechanical room outside of that calculation. And so we had to take the installation, as I said, um, underneath that. Next. Uh, air tightness, um, you know, this was a surprise to us. Uh, you know, requirement is 0.6, no more than 0.6, and we actually achieved 0.2. And, uh, you know, I believe it's largely due to the fact that our air barrier was on the exterior sheathing. Um, we used the plywood sheathing as, as the air barrier, tape sealed with Sega tape and wrapped up over the roof. And, um, you know, I think uh, generally, Larger uh, multifamily buildings tend to perform better uh, with uh, air tightness tests. Uh, to get to smaller buildings, single family homes, sometimes it's a little more difficult to, to achieve. Next. So as we mentioned, you know, the orientation of the building, it, it was a struggle. You know, we, we, our, our instinct was to uh, orient it, uh, you know, large facing south, but um, the, uh, this also played into the sort of energy demand of the uh, um, of the uh, heat gain, and I'll I'll uh, go to the next slide just to just to explain that a bit. Um, because of the cold climate conditions, it was more beneficial to capture the solar heat during the winter to offset the heating uh, heating loads that would be required. Um, so the downside is the need for cooling in the summer months. So by including a, a VRV air source heat pump system, we were able to meet the demand as efficiently as possible. Next slide. Um, so here are the two, uh, the two systems combined, um, the uh, variable refrigerant volume air source heat pump and the central ERV. Uh, Stuart, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything else uh, to this conversation or we can talk about it um, at the end. Yeah, I can talk about it in the, the lessons learned, I think. In the lessons learned, okay, great. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a picture of uh, one of the ERV units uh, that located inside the uh, mechanical room. As we mentioned, that whole room uh, is outside the Passivos envelope. And um, we needed steel columns uh, and beams to support the spans for that room, uh, but we we're concerned about the thermal bridging of that. And so the structural engineer uh, came up with a solution by uh, creating uh, wood um, bases underneath the columns that connected to the structure below. And so basically the floor that you see there, that's, you know, there's, there's uh, 17 inches of insulation below that even. And so it allowed the steel to stop uh, and not penetrate the insulation plane. Next slide. So here's, a, here's an image of the um, three of the variable refrigerant volume air source heat pumps that we used. And they're attached to uh, louvered grills in the, uh, in the sidewall of the mechanical room. And um, uh, so these units are capable of operating to minus 20 degrees. And so supplemental heat in, the, in this mechanical room uh, is there to make sure uh, the temperature doesn't drop below minus 20. Next. Paul, maybe I should chime in there. I see some sure. questions circulating. Could we? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the, the basic premise here, uh, as Paul mentioned, the, these heat pumps operate to minus 20. This project, um, you know, we were designing in 2017, 2018. This was before Daikin's Aurora line came out. So, you know, which has no cutout temperature per se, whereas these lim these units are limited to minus 20. Um, and so what's not shown here is that they're actually gas unit heaters in this penthouse. And in addition, there is a louver setup that allows us to either 
expose the air source heat pumps to the outdoor ambient environment or to enclose them within the penthouse. And, and that's what we see changing over at minus 20. When we see minus 20 outdoors, the exterior louvers close, the penthouse becomes an indoor space and the unit heaters cascade on to provide supplemental heat to, to maintain uh, conditions in that penthouse within the, the capacity range of these heat pumps. Great, thanks Stuart. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so regarding the facade, this is just, uh, uh, just a reminder, you know, that the design responds, you know, each, each facade responds differently to the solar orientations while still maintaining uh, a unified material and color palette. Next slide. So now we'll take a look at some of the details uh, that we encountered. Um, as we mentioned before, um, we encountered uh, poor soil conditions requiring piles, grade beams and suspended slab. And so where uh, at each point where the pile hit uh, connected with the grade beam, we had to uh, record that in the PHPP model. So that was considered a thermal bridge and, um, and so that gave rise to, you know, making sure we had a sufficient um, insulation through that foundation to, to compensate. Uh, so we took the eight inches of insulation from the exterior cladding down, wrapped along the face of the, uh, the grade beam and underneath the grade beam. And then I think it's 150 millimeters uh, on the interior sides. And then under the slab, the suspended slab, we had 150. 20 or sorry 270 uh, millimeters of insulation and then because we also had the, the clay we had to include um, void form insulation underneath all of that as well to uh, allow for any kind of movement next slide so this is an image of uh, you can see the insulation underneath the grade beams they're, they're being formed up and, and poured uh, in this photo Next slide. And then the, uh, you know, we backfill, the gray beams are there, they fully insulated. And uh, we've just seen the slab, uh, which had its insulation underneath as well. Uh, and the, um, the air barrier under that. Next slide. So with respect to the exterior cladding, and in fact, the, the framing of the building, when we first approached, you know, got together as a team, we just assumed that we were building a double wall system uh, for the building, one for the structural studs for low bearing and, and a second uh, set of framing to house you know, thick, we were expecting probably 10 inches of insulation, uh, usually handled with TGIs or, or something like that, which was conventional at the time. Um, and then uh, you know, WCPG analyzed the construction schedule and realized it was gonna have a two to three month impact uh, delay in the, in the project. And so we switched to a strap uh, scenario, insulation and strapping where, where our strapping would screw right through the insulation to the um, structural frame. And to do that, those strapping nails have to, or screws have to hit a structural stud. And, um, and so that is very difficult as well uh, you've got, it takes a lot of precision to blindly line up and make sure each screw hits hits the structural stud, and uh, with a you know a premium on the on the air barrier, you can't if you miss uh, a screw, you can't pull it out, and so we're we're worried about that and and trades maybe pulling them out and and not sealing the holes, and so it was decided uh, the structural engineer was able to thicken the exterior sheathing to a point where we could screw in. Uh, the strapping through eight inches of insulation and just hit the plywood wherever it was needed. And, um, and that proved to uh, really uh, expedite the, the construction process and provide, provided a great air barrier, as you can see by, by the results. And uh, I know, Doug, um, you've got some, you'll talk about this, uh, I think, uh, at the end about, about that. Okay, yes. next slide. So here's a, uh, plan detail of a typical exterior wall and the window install uh, with a vertical sunshade there. And um, so you can see we've got the thicker um, exterior sheathing. Our air barrier is in red, um, which basically was tape joints with a uh, Sega tape. 
And um, so when we ran the therm models, uh, you can see in the color diagrams here, uh, looking at the performance of the window installation, we, um, we had the window set a little bit further back. And um, uh, so billing envelope consultant was asking, you know, can we move the windows further into the insulation, which these are triple glazed windows, fairly large in size, so they're quite heavy. So you can't just move them out into the insulation. They need to be supported, you know, that extra edge. And we were worried about using angles and, and things like that. So um, uh, Pat Cuthbert came up with, with uh, this um, blocking that's beveled so you can get an easy transition of your membranes from the, from the sheathing and into the window frame. Uh, gives you the extra support. And so when we ran the therm models, uh, you could see the psi value there for that installation was just slightly improved and it, and it actually you know, contributed to our overall energy performance. Uh, next, next slide. So here's some photos of the installation. Um, we've got uh, our uh, exterior sheathing membrane over top of the plywood. You can see just at the bottom where the Sega tape, those joints are, are sealed up. And, uh, and then at the window, we have the beveled uh, frame there. And, uh, and then we also wrap the windows with uh, aluminum closure to uh, close off the insulation and, um, and sort of make a, a tidy sort of watertight uh, uh, enclosure. And so um, the picture here with all the insulation on, um, another thing to, to be aware of when you're using the technique of strapping uh, through the insulation uh, and not using the, you know, the clips and uh, you can get, uh, you can get those thermal clips that come all the way through the insulation, uh, but they have a bit of a, a cost as well. Um, so when you're screwing through, you have to specify the right density of insulation so it doesn't uh, uh, compress as you screw in the strapping through it. And we, you know, Pat uh, brought some lessons learned to us uh, in other projects that were um, didn't have uh, as, as dense of insulation. And so the result was all of that strapping was wavy and you really couldn't tell in this photo uh, or at this stage, but once the cladding starts going on and we didn't have that problem in the cladding, cladding went up uh, seamlessly. And it was an outstanding job for them. Next slide. So uh, here is uh, just talking about some of the thermal bridging. So we are, we did add, uh, you know, vertical and horizontal sunshades to the to the building, and we wanted to minimize the connection points. And so we went with two uh, uh, knife plates uh, that would be bolted back to the um, to the plywood sheathing, and uh, with neoprene isolators uh, to try and uh, you know reduce um, the thermal loss. And then, of course, each of these connections had to be modeled in the PHPP model to make sure we're still okay with it. Next. And so here is uh, the horizontal sunshades on the south, south face, same thing, using the knife plate connections uh, for that and thermally modeled. And you can see in the image there, it's sort of in the middle of uh, installation where the layering of the installation is, is going on. And um, then next slide uh, is the final install of that. And um, you can see this photo was taken in the winter so the sun's lower in the horizon. And um, so you actually get the, the winter uh, heat gain uh, when you want it and then shaded in the summer. Next slide. So now we'll talk about lessons learned, get Doug and Stuart uh, involved here. Um, this picture, you know, I love it. It's, uh, it looks like the project was abandoned uh, when the snow came and uh, just a reminder of the race it was really a tremendous race to get that project, the foundation built just in time before winter hit. Uh, and um, uh, Doug and his team did a, did a fantastic job to get that work done. So next slide. So here's a, a series, you know, just architectural points. I think uh, I've covered most of these here. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, I think maybe, uh, Doug, I'm wondering if you want to maybe say something about the window install, uh, you know, the mock-ups, the need for mock-ups and, and organizing your trades. 
Yeah, um, a couple things. I, I know a, a lot of contractors when they first get involved with passive house style or higher energy uh, uh, projects, they're very concerned about being able to get those uh, uh, air sealing details uh, done correctly, um, and and to worry about the the, uh, the, the deeply inset windows uh, getting that flashed properly. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, you know, having a simple form factor building which is a very main passive house principle and that, that Paul, you achieved very well, um, is the biggest thing you can do for, for both of those items and with limited window sizes. So, um, so a couple of things, what we found was, um, you know, with a membrane roof, a simple form factor and good windows, that was key for air sealing. So all we had to do was, tape the sheathing joints uh, in the sheathing, tape the joint between the foundation, the concrete foundation and the walls and tape around the windows. Um, and we achieved 0.2 air changes per hour, which was, uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, a, a great surprise. Um, and, and for us, um, <clears throat> um, having not built like this before, we were very concerned about having this, you know, eight inches of mineral wool insulation on the outside of the building and how that interacts with the window install. Um, and we built several mock-ups on site and, and, and there was many changes that came from that uh, uh, mock-up. And, and one of the interesting things is like, um, like the strapping that uh, goes over top of the mineral wool insulation that will eventually hold the, siding materials, you have to put those screws in from the outside in angled slightly upwards so that they're always under tension. And uh, that way all that strapping doesn't sag under the weight of the uh, cementitious siding materials. And um, um, the, the windows themselves being inset, um, you know, more or less eight inches in this case, uh, really gives the walls a nice depth uh, look to them. Um, but those flashing details had to be worked out carefully. Uh, and, and one of the key principles there is, of course, limited window sizes. Um, and, and once our siding contractor uh, figured out all the window sizes, uh, he had all the flashings made on a CNC uh, flashing brake machine. So they were done very accurately. And we have had zero problems with them in the two years that the building's been in operation. So uh, th that was quite a process to work through just for the more or less window installs. Um, and the windows themselves were an interesting thing because the company that we used was out of Edmonton and they uh, technically did not have passive house certified windows. So as part of the project, we, we had them go through the certification process. Um, that was quite interesting as well. Yeah, that I, I, I was. I think that uh, there's a slide about that uh, to follow here, but uh, then we'll say a few points about it. Um, okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Just to, yeah, I'm just gonna get. We've talked about these the roof slopes. You know, we we sloped it all to one one side, so we didn't have to bring the roof drains through the passive house envelope, and then we're able to feed the water directly to rain gardens. And you know, mechanical keeping it outside, you don't need to pay. Uh, it would be too difficult with all the openings required for ventilation. Has actually made made a lot of sense. Okay, next slide. Um, so, Doug, this is a air barrier insulation. I think you you talked about that. Um, maybe we'll go to the next one. Uh, product delivery and schedule, Doug. You want to, you know, the impacts. I know that did take some time to get some of the some of the materials or products. Yeah, and and. Uh, uh, you know, being a northern community, we, we had delivery issues with many items. You know, right, right, right down to the kitchen cabinets, and uh, um, and I think those issues have become worse in in recent times with COVID and whatnot. So my advice there would definitely be get your materials ordered up early um, and get mm -hmm. them on site, even if you have to store them. Yeah, and there there definitely is a northern um, cost factor, right? To to getting supplies and the cost of materials. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, the window and door manufacturer, you know, Doug, you were, you were talking about that. I just wanted to add, you sort of touched on it. These weren't Passive House uh, certified products. And so it was quite extensive uh, effort to 
um, get all the paperwork, proving the modeling was done uh, to passive house uh, criteria. There's a lot of back and forth. And frankly, that added to uh, some delay in the, in the schedule, the installation of the windows to get that sorted out. Uh, next slide. So over to Stuart. Ventilation. Okay. So back to the mechanical aspect of this. Um, <clears throat> so as Paul mentioned, the building is ventilated via central ERV. Um, there's basically one large swag on gold unit that, that does most of the units. And then there's a, a secondary unit that handles some of the amenity spaces. Um, and so one of the, the real challenges that we dealt with through this project is the difference in ASHRAE uh, code-based ventilation rates, ASHRAE 62.1, versus what um, the PHI recommends um, for buildings of this type. The difference is that the ASHRAE rates are higher, um, you know, 40% higher. And it was a real challenge in that uh, the, the initial passive house consultants ran the PHPP with the, the PHA numbers and the initial uh, HVAC consultant designed to ASHRAE and it kind of didn't come to a head until building permit. And at that point, um, our firm took over the HVAC design and we were, you know, saddled with this challenge of, of making this building certifiable and also code compliant. And what we ended up having to do is, is add an occupancy schedule um, that varies the airflow rate on this central unit so that the design rate and commissioned rate is the ASHRAE levels. Um, but on average, the, the, the total airflow over a day is the, the rate that the PHPP required. So the lesson learned here is make sure from the start, your HVAC engineer and your PASFOS consultant are talking about ventilation rates. And I would recommend that you design for the ASHRAE rates, but have a multi-speed control that allows you to operate at the PHPP rates. And that way you have a good balance. You also have some boost capacity if necessary. Um, that segues into the next slide, which I believe, uh, can, we, can we roll over? So this, yeah, central ERVs versus decentralized. In this case, we went with um, the central ERV because the prevailing uh, knowledge at the time was that this would be the most cost-effective strategy for building this scale. You know, it's a 50-unit building, and if you look at the cost of 50 ERVs compared to one central with the ducting, on the face of it, the central ERV looks more cost-effective. Um, but the end result, uh, the lesson learned is don't do that, <laughs> basically. Um, balancing... Um, the, the, the teeny tiny airflow is required. Like we're talking, you know, 20, 30 CFM per diffuser across 50 units off of one ERV is extremely difficult. Um, it, it costs $15,000 for us to balance the diffusers in the system. And then when, you know, this, this issue of, of PHI versus ASHRAE airflow rates came to a head, we were faced with the, the potential prospect of recommissioning at the, the, the PHI values and, and do that cost premium, it was just not a feasible option. So if you go to, you know, HRV or ERV per suite, or perhaps small groups of suites, it becomes far more feasible to um, design again at the ASHRAE rates, but operate, um, you know, on a, at least a two speed control, operate at the, 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 the PHI rates, and you can easily satisfy both worlds. And in reality, get um, far closer to the, the actual um, desired airflow rates at both central fan speeds. So that's a major takeaway from us, from our perspective. Um, I know we're short time, so let's go to the next slide. Yeah, and so we won't go into this too, too much in depth. Paul kind of mentioned it. Um, you know, in such an extreme climate, meeting the, 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 the annual heating demand target, the 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared in the year, is, that's extremely difficult. And, and as you, you tweak and nudge the levers and knobs within the PHPP, it's important to stay grounded in reality. What is the real world impact of, of some of these decisions? And make sure you plan accordingly. 
Um, the big one here that, you know, due to the site constraints and the desire to not, you know, like basically the budget dictated, we had to go with a double loaded corridor. We couldn't afford to do a single loaded corridor, 50 unit building that all faced South, for example. So we had to stick to double loaded corridor and also due to the other site rest uh, restraints, that's why we have this um, North South elongated building where, where all the units, basically the majority of the exposures is West and East. So that's not ideal from a passive solar design. Um, and the PHPP modeling basically required us to use high solar gain glass on those East and West facades. And anyone who's taken your passive host training knows that that's kind of a, a red flag, right? because you can't control the solar gains really any time of the year, whatever appears you're going to get. I mean, we do have these vertical sunshades that, that do a little bit to, to manage that, but it's not a major impact. So we, we made these decisions due to budget, um, site realities, um, and what the PHP would require, right? And we backstopped that with an air source heat pump um, mechanical strategy that gives us cooling. It's actually more efficient at cooling than heating. And the result of this building is it's actually a cooling dominant building. So we're in an ASHRAE zone 7B climate with a minus 40 Celsius design temperature, and it's a cooling dominant building. So that, that's not a you know, typical outcome for a project in this area, but we have the mechanical uh, systems that can handle it. And as Paul mentioned, uh, you know, we predict the, the future warming trends via uh, climate change, and we're, we're well suited to handle that. So, uh, you know, make sure you understand the real world implications of, of your PHPP driven decisions. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And then the last one here is, you know, there's a drive to electrify buildings. We want to get off fossil fuels, um, you know, using passive house as a, as a building envelope conservation design methodology is, is perfect. It's the right direction. Um, you know, it minimizes your, your peak loads. It minimizes your consumption for heating and cooling compared to different approaches, more active approaches. Be warned though, as you consider electrifying buildings that you will likely on larger scale projects land in commercial industrial rate tariffs with your electric utility. And those rate tariffs are subject to demand charges, which is a completely different uh, rate structure than you know, residential projects are used to where you pay, you know, typically residential, you would pay per kilowatt hour fixed throughout the year. When you get into these rate tariffs, um, the, the cost, the energy charge, the, the, you know, the cents per kilowatt hour is, is almost free, but you're actually being charged based on the peak demand that you ran through that meter in a month. And in a lot of cases, the minimum demand charge throughout the year is 80% of the maximum month. So if you have an electrified building with electric, in, you know, as an example, electric um, supplementary heat for, for winter conditions, you're gonna have a crazy January month and then you're gonna pay 80% of that bill for the rest of the year. And it can completely turn the economics of your project on, on its head. You, you know, we've had, we've done some scenarios where the, 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 the annual cost estimate for, for heating and cooling goes up by a factor of 10 because of the rate tariff structure change. So be warned, okay, when you're, when you're going down this path. That's one of the reasons that we have natural gas as um, the, the supplementary heat um, in this situation to shelter the project from these demand charges. Um, and that's probably all I should say to keep time tight here. Can we go to the next slide? I think that's it. There you go. I, I just wanted to, to mention one more thing about uh, the type of walls that we uh, to build. Um, any double wall system results in the your 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 last condensation surface to the inside surface of your exterior season. You have very high condensation potential on that surface. Uh, we went with a single wall system with continuous exterior insulation and. During the course of construction, BC Housing called various sensors inside the walls in, in uh, many locations uh, to check on the performance of how those walls were doing. And we've got that data back now. And from both a, a temperature and moisture perspective, those walls are performing very well. So I, I, would, I would say one of my lessons, <coughs> I, I really quite like the single 
frame wall approach with continuous exterior insulation for that very eliminates that condensation potential. That would be it. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Paul, Stuart, and Doug for uh, uh, a very detailed presentation. Uh, I, and I think this building and, and the technical details you got into proves the old adage that uh, beauty is more than skin deep. Uh, and uh, beautiful building uh, and some beautiful uh, design and engineering uh, and construction behind it. So uh, thanks for sharing that with us. We're running a little behind, but we know there's a lot of questions. So I'm going to stop here and say thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, what questions uh, do we have? We have a few minutes for questions. Let's get some of them on the floor. Oh, sounds great. Thank you, Chris. Um, there was a really active chat here, so we're going to do our best to go, go through them and maybe try to capture the questions at the end as well and maybe uh, go to some other questions and respond back later after the session. Uh, one of the first ones is how are the how are the protrusions on the south side designed to curb thermal bridges? Yeah, well, they couldn't be avoided. Um, so, you know, we needed uh, metal to go back and bolt to the sheathing. So we, we added a, a neoprene gasket between this, the metal and the, and the plywood when it was bolted and then factored those uh, cold bridges. They're limited to, you know, a couple per sunshade and factored those into the energy model. So we couldn't avoid them. Okay, thank you. Another question um, from Mohammed. Any challenges with regards to centralized ERV, smoke damper and ducting, as opposed to in-suite ERV? Yes. <laughs> Balancing a, a central ERV at this scale, especially with the teeny tiny airflows you actually want at each location, it was extremely difficult and I, and I don't recommend it. Okay. You, yeah, go, go, with decent, go with decentralized. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. Um, a question came up regarding um, health considerations for shared air, COVID, et cetera. Yeah, so it's not actually shared air. I mean, with a, with a, a central ERV, um, we're direct ducting the supply air to each suite and we're, we're directly extracting exhaust air from each suite location and the, the two air paths don't actually cross. Um, they go through a heat exchanger, they don't yeah. actually mix. And there's very, very, you know, minimal amounts of mixing, like under 2%. Um, so it's not a concern. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. What provisions were made to prevent freezing the ERV core during winter operation? Yeah, so the, the swag on units um, require preheating uh, up to about minus 15. So there are, there's a natural gas um, preheater on the big one. Okay. Um, is the mechanical room enclosed to prevent snow and ice from blocking the HP. The heat pumps. Heat pump. No, yeah. they're, in, they're enclosed to, because they're not capable of operating down to minus 40 without supplement. So they're enclosed to allow, like we, we could have found some better pictures perhaps, but there's louvers on the outside um, in alignment with the, the discharge and intake of the, the heat pumps. And in moderate conditions, the penthouse is wide open. So in effect, it's outside from a temperature perspective. But when we hit that minus 15, minus 20 threshold, it locks down, the louvers close, and it's, it recirculates air within the, the penthouse. And we can blast heat in through these natural gas unit heaters. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. What is the insulation under the slab? EPS, XPS, or other affects performance when wet and or extremely cold? Yeah. Um... I thought it was EPS. It's EPS, yeah. yeah. It's, it's warm because it's in ground contact largely and it's dry because it's raised up. Um, this is all suspended slab and grade beam on piles. Okay, um, we're, we're at a few minutes past right now, but I think maybe we'll do, just do a few more questions here. Did you add blocking for the cladding? Uh, no. No. No, the, the, the cladding, uh, the, the straps, that the cladding is suspended off, uh, or that the cladding is attached to is uh, screwed. Um, we use 12 inch long screws and it's screwed right through the eight inches of uh, exterior mineral insulation and keeping them on that downward sloping angle and the high density of the insulation is uh, all you need. It, it self supports after that. Okay, thank you. 
Um, did the project see a cost savings in tandem with the schedule advantage with the switch of the tendered assembly to the 28.6 millimeter plywood sheathing, long fasteners and strapping change? Uh, it's hard to say what was saved there. I, I know in the end, uh, that was definitely easier for the siding contractor um, to not have to worry about hitting hitting those studs. And uh, I, I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but the siding contractor did an amazing job. It is just a great looking building. Okay. So I don't know if we saved any time or not, but in the end, we're, we're happy about that decision. Okay. I think there's a, there's a familiarity thing too that you'll come across with these projects. So the structural engineer was not that familiar with double stud wall construction. And that was one of the reasons that they went this way. And it's also one of the reasons that the, the wood sheathing is so thick. As someone mentioned, thinner mm -hmm. perhaps could have been sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. And there was, I, I did see a question come up about the sheathing. It is, it is a single layer of inch and an eighth sheathing. It is not built up out of two layers. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to probably have to wrap this up. So I'm going to have one more one more quick question. Um, did you use automatic balancing dampers, constant airflow regulators to help with balancing? No, it's a cost issue. I think there were some 250 diffusers that would really add up. Okay, all right. I'm going to thank thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to turn it back to uh, to Chris. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, again, thank you for uh, a great presentation. Thank you for taking the questions. And I know, uh, Sarah, we will figure out a way of, of tracking the uh, questions we couldn't answer to make sure that uh, uh, we, answer as, we have as many of them answered as possible. And really, this is the whole reason that we wanted to run this cold climate section uh, sessions was to answer these types of questions, especially for folks who maybe haven't had experience with a, a passive house build before. And there were lots of uh, lessons to take away here. So let's go back to the slides if we can. And I'll wrap things up. So we, we heard about uh, lessons learned. We heard about uh, uh, mock-ups on site. And I, I want to just reassure people um, if you've not been involved in, in high performance, passive house building in past, um, uh, as we like jokingly say, uh, it's not rocket science, but it is building science. And we're, we're here, to, uh, we're here to, to help with a lot of uh, uh, resources, a lot of training. We have coming up a few things. I want to run through them quickly. The Built in Canada Lessons Learned from Passive House Projects. This is a series that runs right across the country. Uh, the next one is June 25th. Next slide. Um, if you're interested in taking some education, we have our Pathway to Designer Consultant Certification course. We have the next one starting July 5th. This is a great course for architects and engineers. Uh, uh, building scientists, people uh, involved, obviously, in the design of, of these high performance passive house buildings. Next slide. And uh, we have a few other interesting ones. The pattern language for passive house, uh, how to design and build high performance multi unit buildings at the lowest possible cost. Uh, very interesting and well subscribed uh, uh, course coming up starting July 7th. Next slide. Uh, and one that's really of interest, the Pathways to Passive House Trades Certification. Uh, you know, there's a lot of concern that uh, it's one thing to have our architects and, and engineers and building scientists trained up on uh, how to build high performance passive house. What about tradespeople? Uh, and I can tell you, we've been very successful in this area um, that, uh, you know, our trades program is about three days. Uh, there's a hands-on component when we're allowed to visit uh, to get together, there'll be the hands-on again. But, but getting tradespeople up to speed is not as difficult as some people fear. Um, and we are here to help you with that as well by providing say, the, uh, the trade certification. Next slide. And that's it. That's a thank you from us at Passive House Canada. Thank you again to uh, Paul and Stuart and Doug for all of your insight. And uh, again, what a beautiful building. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's fascinating to see how it all came together in a very challenging environment, Northern British Columbia. 
Um, but you know, you've you've done a great job with that uh, with that building. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more of your projects, more of your successes in the uh, in the years ahead. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks to the audience for being here. This is being recorded, uh, so we'll have it on our YouTube channel fairly quickly, and we'll follow up with questions as soon as we possibly can. Take care, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, all. Thank you. Do it, Doug.